I'm delighted to welcome Marla, a well-known and respected economist from the Caribbean, and Shireen, a thought-leading academic and constitutional lawyer from Australia, to discuss Scotland's new central bank at our Festival of Economics. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Good to be here. Well, Thanks Shireen and Marla, congratulations me. on your completely fictitious appointment by Scotonomics on behalf of the Scottish Government to help set the framework for a new central bank for our newly independent monetary sovereign government. We can't wait to hear your ideas. Now, Scotland as a newly independent nation, again, with a strong but challenging economic outlook, we'd like to start with a blank canvas when considering the functioning of a central bank. What do central banks do? And could you highlight the absolute necessary functions of a central bank and the functions that perhaps have developed over time and might not have always been classed as core functions? Thanks for that question. It's a good question, William. And I have to say that from my read of it, the functions and roles and responsibilities of central banks can vary according to the size and type of country that we're talking about. In the Caribbean, it's not the same that you would have, for example, the Bank of England. So there are some nuances when you're a small, especially a small, a newly independent country that's just starting out. But in general, the roles and functions of this new central bank for newly independent Scotland, first of all, you will be, the central bank will be the lender of last resort to all of the commercial banks and financial um, licensed financial institutions that are regulated by this central bank. And oftentimes, the central bank is also the lender of last resort to the government. Sometimes the governments, it's been our experience in the Caribbean, are unable to raise debt commercially to finance their deficit for various reasons, low credit ratings um, being one of them, high risk. Um, and sometimes the central bank ends up financing government, which of course is not a good idea, basically printing money to give to the government. So that's also um, one of the key roles um, that a central bank can play. Central banks also conduct monetary policy with the focus mainly on overall price stability, and that means controlling inflation. And they do this mainly via interest rates. But sometimes in developing countries, interest rates are not necessarily the best mechanism. And so you find sometimes I've seen examples where they use the reserve requirement that they apply to banks. They use open market operations um, and other mechanisms such as regulating the amount of credit that banks can give in the economy. Um, also, interest rates can be used to manage your exchange rate. And that's also a key function of a central bank to manage the exchange rate, meaning the rate of exchange between your currency and the rest of the world. Central banks also create and regulate the amount of local currency in circulation. They issue notes and coins, physical notes and coins, for example, as well as electronic money. That's the kind of money we use when we use our credit cards and so on. And they put that money into circulation in the, in the country, in the economy, mainly by buying um, securities from the government, buying government paper. And they can also use that mechanism to control inflation. And they can also use that mechanism and, the, and controlling money supply in order to manage the exchange rate. And that foreign exchange regulation aspect of a central bank is probably more important in small open economies um, than in some of the larger economies where they have what we call hard currencies, currencies that are easily convertible to any currency on the international market. Central banks also um, regulate the licensed financial institutions. So all of the banks and credit unions and insurance companies, they have to, to um, basically, they have oversight over these um, institutions to make sure that they're properly run and to manage the risk um, associated with this type of, of um, intermediary activity. They also manage the central bank that is manages the interbank market between these institutions and also the national payment system and increasingly e-money issuers and digital wallets. And so that's generally what a central bank um, would be uh, mostly focused on. Do you share the same views with regards to the core functions of a central bank? I was fascinated by Marla's explanations of all the functions of a central bank. It's a lot. Um, kind of wanted to talk about the 
mandate of a central bank? Because, you know, Marla, you spoke about what you want your central bank and your economy to do. Um, a lot of economies try and achieve that by giving their central bank a particular mandate. So, Marla, we've spoken to thinking about the, the mandates. Can we look at this in a bit more detail? What impact do these mandates actually have on the economy? Who sets the mandate for a central bank? Can they be changed? And then I'd love to hear what Shireen's thoughts are on that. I think this mandate has to come largely from, again, the goals, but also from the political um, arena where you decide what exactly, I'll give you an example, as I mentioned earlier, in Jamaica and in um, Dominican Republic, they look at inflation targeting. They want to have inflation between a range of 2 to 4%, let's just say. Unfortunately, many of us in the Caribbean, we do not have a clear mandate that says, well, the central bank has a goal of targeting inflation of this amount or growth of that amount or unemployment of another. And so it's very difficult to understand what the policy direction is. Sometimes you have governments that are deficit spending and central banks that are tightening. So you have contradictory monetary policy and fiscal policy. And so it is very important to have a clear mandate, but not every central bank has that. And in terms of the roles that central banks take on, a lot of the central banks in the Caribbean have what you might consider to be socioeconomic development roles. So for example, they take on the role of trying to boost financial inclusion because you can't solve poverty without solving financial inclusion. You can't solve gender equality without solving, you can't solve many um, uh, social problems without solving financial inclusion. So some central banks in this region have a, a, a finan financial inclusion strategy to make sure everybody is financially included. Also, you have central banks that have other socially minded um, um, goals and, and mandates. So, for example, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which I mentioned earlier, which is a monetary union of eight countries in the Caribbean. They are the first central bank on this planet to be 100 percent solar powered. And it's based in St. Kitts. I went there a couple of weeks ago. And the reason they did this was to demonstrate by example and lead by example that renewable energy is the way of the future, especially for a region like us, where we are not part of the climate crisis problem. We didn't cause this because we are less than 1% of global carbon emissions. But we are heavily impacted and we have to be part of the solution and demonstrate that we're willing to to make the changes necessary to, to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's what the central bank has done. So in a nutshell, I would say that the mandate sometimes is very clear and sometimes it's not. And certainly in my space, there is a lot of development type roles that, are, that central banks can take on in their mandate. Um, and perhaps in your country, even though you're not a developing country, the fact is you will be newly independent and there will be development type goals, I would imagine, that you would want to achieve um, for your country that the central bank can perhaps support, if not take on, um, from a policy perspective. Shireen, you've got significant concerns around the mandate of a modern central bank, especially the kind of democratic oversight and the constitutional implications. And you've spent quite a lot of time looking at the impact of the central bank mandate of the RBA on the Australian economy and society. So what's your thoughts on the mandates that central banks have? That the mandate for the Australian Reserve Bank is they're supposed to look at, look at price stability and full employment and economic prosperity for the Australian people. In reality, it's inflation targeting a goal of 2 to 3%, as Marla said, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Marla, but that seems to be the kind of there seems to be internationally an agreement yes. that central banks should prioritise inflation targeting. And in Australia, we saw this formalised in that 1996 agreement between um, the Treasurer and the Reserve Bank. Now, to me, this is, this is a problem because what it leads to is a real deprioritisation of the goal of full employment. And, of course, that term full employment has been kind of the meaning of it has been 
become confused because of the Nauru and you know the natural rate of unemployment that that um, that economists adopt. And so Australian citizens probably don't, or many probably don't realise that when economists talk about full employment, they're really saying we accept four to five percent unemployment. <laughs> now, what this means is that the unelected Reserve Bank is sort of making these really crucial decisions. Currently, we're seeing it play out currently in Australia, this big effort to fight inflation, which is too high, um, and historically low unemployment. The, the Reserve Bank and the government sort of agree that, they, and you, sometimes you catch them saying it explicitly, that soon historically low unemployment is going to rise, right? So, so there is this, this um, decision being made by unelected um, technocrats in the Reserve Bank that Australians will be made unemployed. Growth will be slow. Rates will be uh, increased. Growth will be slowed. And unemployment will be increased to control inflation. And you get this strange dynamic where the elected government adopts a sort of passive fiscal stance so as not to contradict the efforts of the Reserve Bank to control inflation. And I think this has contributed to a sense of economic reform inertia in Australia, you know. So, so we're, um, you know, it was amazing. In, in 2017, former Prime Minister Paul Keating, the creator of Australia's modern liberal economy, the, the sort of one of the key architects of the accords in the 1980s, the lib he, he led the liberalisation of Australia's economy. Um, he said in 2017, um, liberal economics has come to a dead end, he said. <laughs> it needs urgent renovation, you know. Um, and it's, I guess, you know, that the fact that independent, true independence it was of the Reserve Bank was ceded by Keating in the 80s was really achieved and consolidated in that 1996 agreement um, and at the same time you see this prioritisation of inflation targeting taking hold. I think one of the key problems to come out of this is that in public policy discussions now there is a sense that this is the orthodoxy, you know, this is the orthodoxy and it can't be questioned even though this approach has really only been formalised in Australia over the last few decades. Um, so, so that is one of the frustrations that I see in, in the current public policy debate. And I don't see enough discussion about the economic reforms needed to truly address inequality, for example, mm. or to achieve true full employment, as used to be the bipartisan goal of governments in the post-war era. To ask a really direct question, because Shireen said it very clearly, um, central banks slow down the economy to make people unemployed. Is that, would you would you be as direct as that? Because well, I think people would be surprised well, if they found out that a role of the central bank in a modern economy is to make more of them unemployed. Well, that's not, no. I think what Shireen is trying to say is that's the current scenario because we've had since February of last year when Russia invaded Ukraine, we've had inflation really take off based on the restrictions of certain commodities um, being exported out of that region, especially energy and wheat and so on. That, that's, that's where we're at now. It's not that central banks exist universally all the time to make people unemployed. One of the central and most Are they doing that right now? Are they doing that right now? Well, yes. And actually, was it yesterday or the day before um, the Fed? This is basically what was said, that, um, you know, more people will have to become unemployed for, for us to get this inflation rate down to where we would like it to be. So there is this trade-off between inflation and unemployment, right? The more that governments spend or the more money that's printed in the economy, the more economic activity is generated, the more jobs are created. However, so that means unemployment is low, right? Because mm -hmm. employment and jobs are high. However, 
if you keep going with that stimulus, that fiscal and monetary stimulus, so many people will have so much spending power that they will start driving prices up in the economy and you will then get inflation going up. And in order to bring that back down, because one of the central and core roles of a central bank is to maintain price stability, as I mentioned initially, and overall financial stability, but let's focus on price stability. They're going to have to now retreat some of that stimulus, withdraw some of that you know, money supply. The fiscal side, the government will have to retreat some of its spending in order to rebalance things because you, you don't want prices going like this. And you certainly don't want it going like this, which it has been for the past year. So yes, the trade-off is that you slow the economy down and some of those jobs and or wages will suffer in order to moderate inflation. That's just sort of one of the trade-offs that is traditionally the case in, in economics. But I will say to you that that's not necessarily how it works. In, in the Caribbean, for example, in any country that's heavily import dependent, our in inflation rate right now has nothing to do with how buoyant our economy is and how much the government has spent and how many jobs are. We have high unemployment at the same time as we have high inflation, which you know is not supposed to happen. But because we have imported inflation, because we're so import dependent, we do have high inflation. Now, if, gov if central banks raise interest rates, tighten monetary policy, and the, and the government tightens fiscal policy, right when you have all of these price pressures, what does that do? Does that fix the inflation? Absolutely not, because the inflation is imported because we're importing oil and gas and wheat and rice and everything. Yeah. And, and so our domestic policy has no impact whatsoever on the price level. What it does is in increasing interest rates causes a higher cost of living, higher cost of living causes higher poverty, higher inequality, as Shireen mentioned, higher joblessness, and it still doesn't fix the inflation. So that's the other thing that a central bank in Scotland will have to figure out. Um, when and how do I use my monetary policy tools? And if this is in fact imported inflation and has nothing to do with a buoyant Scottish economy, then raising interest rates and tightening monetary policy is just going to make people poorer. Shireen, I remember reading somewhere you said that this kind of trade-off between uh, inflation and unemployment was, I think, you know, to quote you, you said it's a tragedy. W would you like to give us a wee bit more detail on why you think that it's so unfair that it's mm. the poorest people in society who pay the price for keeping prices down? Yeah, and it's, look, it's not only a tragedy. Can I, just to uh, um, add to what Marla just said, it also doesn't make sense because also in Australia, there is widespread acknowledgement that current inflation is primarily driven by supply issues, right, that are out of control, uh, out of our domestic control, um, not primarily driven by too much money in the economy, um, and certainly not driven by wages because Australians have had decades of wage stagnation and now with rising prices, wages, real wages are going backwards, right? And yet you have the Reserve uh, Bank Governor, Philip Lowe, saying, you all workers, you all need to tame your wage expectations lest we be forced to raise the unemployment rate. He, he, he actually sort of said something along those lines towards the end of last year, right? Yeah, and so, that was, the Bank of England said something very similar yes. as well. Um, so, so just think about it. What, um, workers are being asked to pay through low wages and some through losing their livelihoods for inflation they did not cause, right, because there is agreement that, one, um, current inflation is primarily caused by supply issues and two, there is growing acknowledgement that um, price right, inflation is also caused by corporations with pricing power mm -hmm. rising prices. So corporations yeah. making the most of supply issues, making the most of current hype about inflation and mm -hmm. increasing prices to increase profits. 
So, that, so there's growing acknowledgement that those two factors are the, are the real cause of inflation. We all know that raising interest rates will not help address supply issues and probably won't help stop corporations price gouging. In fact, as Marla said, there might be a case where increasing rates will increase costs. It might actually exacerbate inflation, which forces you know, this trade-off, it almost forces the Reserve Bank to keep increasing until it almost breaks the economy. You see what I mean? So it doesn't actually work until you force a lot of people into unemployment. Um, and that's where I come to the unfairness bit, William. You know, there is supposed to be, there is this goal of full employment in, in the RBA's charter. It is really completely ignored. Um, and, you know, surely now is the time for us to be trying to reconceive what are the tools, what are the better tools might be on the table to, that might be more effective at controlling inflation because surely this is not an efficient or productive way to control inflation because sure, making people unemployed is not only, you know, sort of immoral but it's also not not good for the economy. It's a drain on the economy. Long-term unemployment creates all these other social and economic problems that then we as a society need to deal with. This is all happening in uh, an economic environment where benefits are being reduced. Yeah. The central bank is saying you've got to be unemployed, right? But they're unemployed when benefits are really, really low. And so that's like being punished for oh, yeah. being unemployment. And, and in many cases, especially from Westminster, the unemployed, the unemployed are vilified for not finding work. So basically there's a system that's designed yeah. to make these people unemployed. It needs them to be unemployed, but they're punished and shamed for being unemployed. And as you said, and I picked up on that really clearly because that's exactly why I believe, that's a, that's a tragedy that people are backed into this corner and there must be another way there must be other mandates that the central bank can follow. So if there is, and we've got this blank sheet of paper, um, I'd love to hear your your thoughts. And Jean, again, I'm picking up on something you, I read in your wonderful speech that you gave. The scarcity of imagination inhibiting Australian economic reform must be overcome. Marla, how about that? Do you I love it. <laughs> I haven't read really? it. I'm sure, I'm sure. But if, if we had to overcome that um, lack of imagination for a Scottish central bank, Marla, where do we start? I think that in the first place, when we wake up every morning, why do we, why do, we do what we do? We do what we do, presumably, to make our lives and so, or somebody else's life better, right? Our children, our families, you know, and... To me, the central bank shouldn't be any different. The government shouldn't be any different. They should all, these institutions should all be focused on social outcomes. And I think that very clear social outcomes should be as opposed to outcomes that like Shireen discussed, an inflation rate of this amount and an unemployment rate of that amount those things are numbers. First of all, when you start measuring, you start making mistakes. And these numbers don't really mean anything unless you understand what are the social implications. And so I feel like central banks and governments together should be focused on some level of social outcome. We want a poverty rate of X. We want an employment rate of Y. We want everybody to have a certain standard of living or a certain level of gross national happiness, if you, if, you know, as the case may be whatever it is. And, and, and I think that that's really what we need to, and again, it's again, going back to the whole idea of you need to have a vision and whatever that vision is, which must incorporate the social outcomes. I think that's where the central bank really needs to focus its effort and look through that lens in terms of all of its policy decisions. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Marla. Um, you know, the former head of the international head economist of the International Monetary Fund, I think he tweeted at the end of last year something like, "We should dream of a a negotiation between corporations, labor, and the state um, that conceives of a better way of 
controlling inflation that doesn't require a painful slowdown, you know? Um, in my speech that you mentioned, William, I argued for a new accord, a new radical centre accord, um, because in Australia we had the accords of the 1980s where labour and capital got together, um, facilitated by government, and agreed, negotiated a, a way forward, and they agreed to wage restraint in in exchange for certain social benefits, what, what they call the social wage. Um, I argue that we need to do that again. We need to get capital, labour, the state at the table to, as Olivia Blanchard says, to negotiate a better way of controlling inflation, keeping a healthy economy in a way that doesn't make the most vulnerable pay for price stability and in a way that doesn't require a painful slowdown. And I think part of that, the, the, perhaps the res, one of the results of that negotiation should be to acknowledge that the work of central banks is inherently political, right? These choices, as Marla said, they're not just about numbers. You know, it's not some econometric exercise devoid of human consequences. The numbers are real people. You know, when they sit there talking about how we need to raise the unemployment rate, actually those are real human beings that you're consigning to poverty uh, because in Australia, the, as you say, William, the, the rate of benefits is below the poverty line, you know, so we're putting people into poverty. Um, some of the, the new fresh thinking ideas that have been raised in recent months, well, firstly, I think we need to see Get rid of this facade that the Reserve Bank must be independent, given we should acknowledge they are making highly political decisions. I would like to see a better integration, just an upfront integration that the, the Reserve Bank is part of government. They should be working hand in glove with the Treasury, with the government to achieve public policy ends, as Marla says. Um, so some ideas that could come under that are rather than only inflation targeting, perhaps we need to counterbalance inflation targeting with a true employment target, which should mean a fair, finding a fairer synthesis between the dual important goals of price stability on the one hand and true full employment on the other hand. Um, they could involve incorporating the idea of a federal job guarantee, which some argue would be a better and more productive way of managing inflation and stabilising the economy um, so rather than making a, a cohort of Australians unemployed, um, the government could provide a buffer stock of minimum wage jobs, so a job safety net rather than just a below poverty line welfare safety net. Um, and anchored at the minimum wage, the argument is that that would not be inflationary. Additionally, a job guarantee could make unemployed people employable, which should increase competition and also should discipline wage rises. Secondly, I think we should look at cre other creative mechanisms for managing inflation that don't involve making people unemployed. For example, carefully targeted price controls, because why should the most vulnerable pay for price stability by themselves? Perhaps big corporations could forego some profits in order to keep prices stable. And one of the most interesting ideas raised in Australia recently is um, a commentator dug up this old Keynesian idea of um, compulsory saving. Because now think about who are the winners of the current approach. You know, currently, if let's just say um, inflation, the cause of inflation is um, too much money circulation, right? And we do, let's say we do need to pull money out of the economy. The current approach is that we do that by raising interest rates who are the winners of that approach? Well, banks, obviously, because banks get to puff up their profits. Yeah. They, um, they're already wealthy. Those who can afford to save, which, you know, is a, it, right. it isn't a huge percentage of the population in a lot of countries, yeah. So, so really, it's the rich who benefit. You know, people with save, good savings get more interest off those savings. The losers are poor people who are made unemployed. And workers, uh, people with mortgages, we have to hand over money to banks, more money to banks. Now, Keynes raised this alternative idea. If you need to pull money out of, the, out of the system, maybe you could legislate compulsory savings, right? Um, 
So in Australia, we've already got a superannuation system. It's already legislated. So employers, when they pay people, they set some money aside for retirement that, that we are not allowed to touch that money until we pass a certain age. So the architecture is already there. Imagine a system whereby instead of rate rises that give money to banks, you have compulsory savings where you, you're not allowed to spend this money because we've got an inflation problem. But when the inflation cools, that money is still yours and you can spend it later, maybe when the economy needs stimulus. Now, if you think about, you know, on the one, the other idea, of course, is tax, that governments could tax to um, pull money out of the economy. So instead of giving money to, to banks, you give money to government revenue. The problem with that, of course, is it's slow. So if, if you need to implement taxes quickly, um, maybe it's too slow. However, during the global financial crisis, Australia deployed quick cash payments, mm. right? $1,000 and $900 cash payments. So you can do quick, I would imagine there might be a way of quick emergency taxation, right? So instead of giving it to the banks, give it to government. The radical centre, I love this term, radical centre, perhaps a radical centre solution is this idea of compulsory savings. Allow people to keep their money that they've earned. Just don't allow them to spend it right now. Um, so I would, you know, surely we're at a point now, given COVID, given the GFC, given Paul Keating's declaration that liberal economics has come to a dead end, and Olivia Blanchard's comments, surely we need to have some of these creative alternative ideas for how to tackle inflation. They should be part of our discussion right now. And it Absolutely. shouldn't be this situation where, oh, no, this is orthodoxy. It must not be questioned. A couple of things that I've seen us use in the Caribbean is um, the central bank will impose limits on how much credit growth can take place in the economy. So they'll say to the banks, you're not allowed to lend in other words, issue loans beyond a certain, um, you know, increase in your asset base. So that helps to pull some money, some spending and borrowing and, you know, spending fueled by borrowing helps to retreat some of that. And also by raising the reserve requirement of the of the banks. So in other words, banks will have to park more of their liquidity in the central bank as opposed to being able to lend it out. But that's when it's domestically created inflation based on buoyant economic activity and rising wages. For imported inflation, I agree with Shireen around, you know, um, targeted price controls, especially for the basic food items. Um, but also I've seen countries across the region put caps on, on fuel prices, electricity prices, also bringing down the import duties of certain basic food items, and that helps to bring the price on the shelf down. So all of those are ideas that, you know, and you can... I guess you can almost decide on a mix of policy interventions um, that work for your economy. But I wanted to pick up on one point where Shireen was discussing the whole um, idea that, you know, central banks ought not to have this independence um, simply because they, they have to act in cohesion, basically. Um, I think that the reason why in this region we like to have and, so, and Jamaica is a perfect example, just a, a year or so ago or two, um, passed legislation to separate its central bank from its minister, from, you know, influence from its minister of finance. Because the last thing you want is, is a minister of finance who can't balance his budget and can't raise money at a, at a reasonable rate and then tells the central bank, well, you got to print this money. This happened in Barbados. And this is why one of the reasons why we defaulted in 2018, because the minister of finance told the governor, you got to print $50 million every month for me to pay salaries. Um, and if you have independence, a central bank is supposed to act according to its mandate, whether that mandate is price stability or, or unemployment or whatever the target is. And so in some circumstances, I believe, especially when there is a tendency to have, from a historical perspective, for, to, to have this situation where central banks print and finance the government excessively, I think it would be a good idea to have some independence with the understanding that there must be policy coordination. Otherwise, you're just defeating the purpose. No central bank is truly independent. What, what do you both think was the main driver for this push 
globally for central banks to become independent. I think, you know, kind of mid 90s is when this kind of, I hesitate to call it a craze, but when this kind of economic orthodoxy was that um, central banks have to be independent, what were the main drivers for that? And very briefly, what impact do you think that little decision has had on how we run our economies? Um, Marla, would you like to go first? I would imagine it's so that uh, central banks don't excessively finance um, governments um, and support their, you know, an irresponsible behavior. Um, we certainly did not participate in that wave <laughs> in this region, and some of us should have actually. Um, and but I would imagine the consequences of the independence are, like Shireen highlighted, that you will get this disharmony between fiscal policy and monetary policy, and also this you know, sort of, um, you know, tunnel vision focus on making sure that in variables, inflation, unemployment, or whatever your mandate is, making sure those variables are right, as opposed to supporting what the political goals are that include more broad social type goals. Um, but my experience in the Caribbean is that our central banks are very socially minded. So, Having independent central banks that are that are that much more development or socially minded, I think would would be that much more constructive for our economies than having central banks that are beholden to the Minister of Finance and will print, which has happened too many times in too many countries in this region. It's interesting. There was this fascinating parliamentary debate when the Reserve Bank bill was being uh, proposed in 1959, I think it was. And the Liberal government was proposing this bill say, to counteract Labor's attempted socialisation of the banking system, they said, um, and to increase cooperation between the central bank and private banks, right? And Labor in the parliament was saying, no, 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 the central bank belongs to the people. It needs democratic oversight. What you're doing is you're going to shackle the power of parliament over these fine uh, monetary decisions right anyway um it, there was one line in there that uh where in the end the liberal government got its its bill through and um one of the labor parliamentarians said oh this is because um you know you've got 17 private bank directors um a significant cohort of whom didn't even reside in australia basically persuading the politicians to to make um set the central bank it more independent from parliament, the people, the people as represented by parliament, and more cooperative with private financial institutions. And so some scholars say that central bank accountability to the public sphere has been replaced over time to by implicit subordination to financial uh, institutions. I think that's what's happened in Australia as well. And, the, you know, the members, the Reserve Bank Board, are people who come from the financial sector. And we were just talking about who benefits now, you know, who benefits now from rate rise, to the current rate rise as well, the financial sector benefits. Um, the, the US economist Eric Leeper came to Australia and gave a paper at an RBA conference last year, I think it was, and he said, this thing of central bank independence, and he's a mainstream economist, by the way, from what I can gather. He said central bank is independence is a gift from politicians to themselves. It enables blame shifting so that when these tough decisions happen, um, you know, it's a, he said it's a whipping boy for, that politicians can use when the economy turns sour. And I, I can see this happening now in Australia. Absolutely. That's the real politic of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. politicians kind of play this game, even though there is agreement that uh, on inflation targeting, politicians distance themselves from the decision, current decisions of the Reserve Bank, which are painful to many in society, right? And they say this has nothing to do with us, almost as if they've got no power over, over the Reserve Bank, no power over these decisions, um, and th these decisions have nothing to do with us. So then the question for us as citizens is, so where does democratic accountability lie? 
if if we don't like the current economic decisions playing out, if we think they're unfair, who can I complain to now? Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. So, Marla, that's I guess it's my that because maybe because I'm a constitutional lawyer. Yeah. That's the problem that I see with this sort of performance of Reserve Bank independence because it's not true independence because right. the government has a veto. In Australia, the government has a veto over RBA policy, which it never uses by convention, right? Yeah. It is the independence appears to be more like a political convenience, like, like Leaper says, but the downside of, of it, I think, as citizens, we lose out because in the end, there's no one we can hold accountable when we think that economic management is poor or decisions are unfair. You're right. There isn't anybody to hold accountable. Um, but even when politicians uh, make poor decisions, you know, yes, they can get voted out, but it's with a lag. Um, but no, I see your point. Uh, but I don't know, is, is, is the central bank governor... Um, a political appointee in Australia, because for, for us in the Caribbean, it is. And so one yes. would imagine that there you go. So they're really, as you said, it's it's a, it's posturing in terms of the independence, yeah. but without the accountability factor. Yeah. It um, sounds like a, sa a savvy Scottish government would make sure that the bank was independent, whereas a savvy public would make sure that the bank had a close... Um, uh, responsibility and a close link to a democratic process. Thing, um, yeah, streams. except that you would also want to make sure that there is some clause in there that says, you know, the central bank governor um, ought not to, to just follow the instructions of the minister of finance as it relates to printing money to finance the government's deficit. Um, that that's not necessarily something you would want to put yourself at risk of. Just speaking from <laughs> my experience here in the Caribbean. Yeah. Well, well, the last thing I want to touch on is one of the themes for the Festival of Economics, which is the just transition um, and the climate crisis. So uh, uh, thinking about a central bank and looking at its mandate, what role could or should a central bank play in a green or a just transition. Marla, any thoughts on that? Yes, actually, um, we're seeing increasingly that central banks are asking their licensed um, financial uh, entities like banks and uh, credit unions and insurance companies even to report on their ESG um, rating. And so this, if, if your regulator is now mandating that you have an ESG policy and you report on your ESG um, outcomes, then that, I think, is a very powerful tool towards um, making sure that we have this, this just transition. The other thing I really am very fond of, um, and it's got nothing to do with central banks, but if you've ever had a chance to look at Bhutan and how they measure gross national happiness. And of course, it's a lot broader than just happiness. It's, it, it's kind of like ESG, but, but for a whole country. And I think that if as a country, you adopt, you know, gross national happiness goals as your vision, as your overarching goal, um, the central bank will have a very important role to play in the policies that it sets in terms of how it regulates, as I mentioned just now, but also um, how it actually behaves. And so issuance of notes and coins is, a, is an important factor and the way that it manages inflation and the way that it manages um, all of the other, the exchange rate and so on. All of those things, I think, um, if you had this overarching goal of, let's just call it ESG for countries, this gross national happiness, I think that can really make an, um, an important difference. It fits into the conversation we're having in Australia at the moment about whether we should have a well-being budget. So, you know, a different way, a different set of measures, as you're saying, Marla, by which to assess Australian economic performance. You know, so rather than the focus being on is the, is the government books in surplus or is it in deficit, um, that shouldn't be the only measure of a healthy economy. What about true full employment? What about reducing emissions? 
What about, um, you know, gender equality or um, educational outcomes by international standards? And I suppose it relates back to my point that I would like to see the central bank working hand in glove to achieve public policy goals determined by the elected government. Um, that's, that should be the role of the central bank, to support the elected government achieve its public policy goals. Um, and, and those goals should go beyond um, simply balancing the government books. They should go speak to the kind of outcomes we want to see in society and the economy. And I forgot to mention this, like I said earlier, you know, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is the first um, central bank on earth to be 100% solar powered. I think that's an important factor for all central banks to consider that they need to lead by example in terms of the way that they conduct them themselves, their operations, their business. I think that's also very important. We also have a very important role that central banks play in this region, which is statistics and data. They collect and publish a lot of statistics. And I feel like that's a role that has, I mean, immense value. And I think that if they were to adopt measuring things like Shireen said, your carbon emissions and measuring things like gender equality and measuring more social outcomes as opposed to financial data and inflation data and so on. I think that just having that data, measuring it and publishing it can help to drive policy action to make those statistics look better over time. Yeah, yeah. What, what you measure tends to matter. So exactly. I, I definitely agree with that. Marla, Shireen, thank you so much. You've, you've given us a wonderful canvas. Now, I feel um, a little bit apprehensive on for, for Tim and um, Stuart, who are now going to look at their prospectuses and have the audience look at their perspective, considering we've had this really um, high-level view. But that, that's what we wanted this session to do, to allow the audience to kind of look at these prospectuses with a much wider frame. So thank you so much for your engagement. It means a whole lot to us and everyone who's here today. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck.